I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade and said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. You also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul was persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be stormed, and she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. When they heard this, they were enraged and shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the confusion, and people rushed together to the theatre, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus. Macedonians who were Paul's travel companions. Paul wished to go into the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some officials of the province of Asia, who were friendly to him, sent him a message urging him not to venture into the theatre. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing, some another. But the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd gave instructions to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward. And Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defense before the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, all of them shouted in unity, great is art in this of the Ephesians. But when the town clerk had quiet from the crowd, he said, citizens of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis, and of the statue that fell from heaven? Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You have brought these men here who were neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the artisans with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro -consuls. Let them bring charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this promotion. And when he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of God. Thanks, Paul, for speaking to us. I'll just wait to be turned down just a little bit. Uh, and it'll help us to have our Bibles open in front of us. So if we haven't got uh, your Bible in front of us, then do uh, turn to page 146 or 145. Uh, in our New Testament sections, and I'm just going to pray for us as we continue with our theme this morning, uh, and we're looking in this whole series about getting on well, uh, and this morning we're particularly asking ourselves the question, what does it mean to get on well as members of the local community? So let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, on this first day of the week, uh, we get together in your presence. We're delighted to be your people in this local community. Uh, we're, be, uh, we're delighted to be those who in word and deed and thought uh, shout the message, great 
is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray that this morning you would help us to delight in you. And we pray that you'd help us to go out into our community in the week ahead, infused to declare your praises wherever we are. In your name we pray. Amen. Great. Just before we go on, I just want to check that I am okay. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that my level is going up and down and I'm a little bit crackly. But are we okay? Can we all hear? I'll power on. Great. Uh, I wonder, let me start off by asking you a question. Uh, uh, the question is, do you feel like a member of the Mafia? Uh, it's a slightly weird question to uh, start a sermon with, but a few years ago I uh, was in a meeting and I was asked that same question. Do you feel like a member uh, of the Mafia? The person who asked me the question uh, was our local city mayor, Marvin Rees. Uh, and uh, you might uh, be aware of the fact that uh, Marvin is a member of uh, Hope Chapel down in Bristol, uh, a, a, a Christian of really lively faith. Uh, and uh, periodically in Bristol, there are meetings of church leaders where we gather together to pray for the city. Uh, and Marvin quite often comes along to those meetings and we hear from him and we pray for him, certainly with all the items on his uh, to-do list and in his inbox, uh, he is very grateful for all the prayer he can get. Uh, and on one occasion, he just described a significant social justice need in the city that had been highlighted by a local councillor. And this local councillor, who didn't share Marvin's Christian faith, had uh, rocked up to his office to, to find out whether there was anything at all that could be done about this specific need that had been identified uh, in the city. Uh, and the council, led by this councillor on this particular issue, had done their very best to think about the different resource pots in terms of finance and in terms of people around. And what they concluded is actually that there was nothing that the council sensibly on its own could do. And so this councillor had rocked up into Marvin's office and, quote, had said, could you call in your friends in the Christian mafia? Uh, and how that story was related to us was actually one of uh, kind of a, a, it was a touching and an endearing question it wasn't in any way meant to be insulting it wasn't in any way meant to be rude what it was this counsellor a non-christian counsellor acknowledging was that the church in Bristol is powerful it's effective it gets things done on the ground it has resources to mobilize care and compassion and it's there in every community across our city. Are you part of the mafia? Uh, it's a reminder that actually our cities are complex fabrics of civil concerns, civic pride, uh, politics, finance, economics, faith, all bound together. Uh, and as we look down at Acts 19 this morning, we're going to be seeing the same thing. Just take a look at verse 23 that begins the passage that Paul read for us this morning. It begins with the words, at that time. So the question, I guess, is what is that time? Let's just sketch out that a little bit. Paul and his missionary colleagues at that time were in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was an academic city. Uh, it had some of the world's leading libraries and teachers. It was a cultural city, media savvy. It had the latest design in local theatres. Some of you may have been to Ephesus and seen the remains of the theatre that still holds 12,000 people and quite regularly holds international rock concerts. Uh, Ephesus was a large city uh, in the Roman Empire with therefore a legal apparatus to support that. It was well known as a center for legal business and for courts. It was a port city. Its harbor was actually down a river a little way inland from the main body of the sea, but it had a bustling harbour that brought much trade to the city. It was a magnet 
for tourists who came to marvel at some of its history and its cultural uh, artifacts, and a magnet for traders alike, a cosmopolitan city, a leading centre of worship for many different faith communities that had set up along those different trade routes. And it was a city built on hills. I wonder whether you're spotting one or two links between Bristol and the old city of Ephesus. On one of those hills, there was the Temple of Diana, as she was known to the Romans. She was known as Artemis to the Greeks. Uh, and there was this huge man-made temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world built to Diana and in her honour. Uh, an image of Diana, you might have noticed from our passage, the town clerk refers to the image falling from heaven. It's likely that a meteorite had fallen from heaven, but to the people there, it looked like some kind of goddess. They'd set it up in the temple as this image of Diana, and they worshipped it there. And there was a whole kind of cottage industry around it. Not so much cottage, that sounds kind of like rather dismissive. There was this enormous industry in the town. There were silversmiths there. There were people who used to carve wood, make kind of shrines to the goddess Diana, and they'd either be used in people's devotions at the temple itself, or they would take them home as tourist mementos of their visit to the city of Ephesus to use in their worship. And all of that, as you can imagine, brought in a lot of cash for the tradespeople in the city. They'd organised themselves into trades guilds across the city who were immensely powerful. They, built in, they bought in a lot of money. And so we've got this nexus going on between politics and business, between faith, between civic pride, and it's all there in the local fabric of this city. And so Demetrius, in verse 25 of our passage, calls people together from his local guild. And he says that there's been this Christian, Paul, who in verse 26 we read as being up to telling people that gods made by human hands aren't gods at all. Uh, and so, as you might expect, there's been an economic impact of that. Fewer people have been buying the silver shrines, the trade has gone down. If there were stocks and shares, you can imagine them going downhill as well. Uh, Paul elsewhere in the New Testament is really at pains to point out to his followers that they need to be plain speaking, that they shouldn't use artifice or kind of um, kind of manipulative arguments. They should just kind of tell it as it is. So let's assume that Paul's been following his own advice. And he's been pointing out in a non-ambitious, he's not trying to make money, he's not trying to gain a political standing. In a plain way, he's been speaking to the people of Ephesus and say, look, if you make something out of your hands, that is not God. It's something that you've made. It might be something that's special to you, but it is not God and it doesn't have God's powers and therefore it can't be worthy of worship. Uh, the same logic applies to us today, doesn't it? You know, kind of my, my house, it might be valuable to me and it might be important to me, but I shouldn't worship my house. It's made out of human hands. My car might be important to me, it might be valuable to me, but I shouldn't worship or idolize my car. It's just made out of human hands. My education might be important to me. The education of those I care for might be important to me, but I shouldn't idolize it. It's man-made and it's made out of human hands and ultimately knowledge comes from God. My business might be important to me. I might have crafted it with great care, but I shouldn't idolize it. It's made with human hands. I should worship God. Well, to his part, uh, Demetrius is worried. Uh, his main concerns are almost inevitably economic. That's the argument that he wheels out first, but he's also a great local politician. And so he wants to bring in his political arguments and his civic arguments and any argument he can marshal to his cause. Just have a look at verse 27. Here's what he says. There is a danger that not only this trade of ours may come into disrepute, that's his real concern, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned and she'll be deprived of her majesty 
that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. When they heard this, verse 28, they were enraged and shouted, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. We've got civic pride going on. We've got faith going on. We've got business going on. It's all the local fabric, a potent mix. Verse 29, soon the city was filled with confusion and the people rushed into the 12,000 seat theatre. This is a fairly big riot about to happen dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travel companions. So we've got quite a cliffhanger as we approach the theatre and we're about to go into a full-scale rumble. Uh, and so the question for this morning is, what can we learn as Christians from this context that might help us to live well locally within our community, which isn't so different? It's not so long ago that we had mounted police on the streets of Bristol and a big demonstration taking place several times in recent history. Are there helpful pointers that we can take from this situation? Firstly, it seems that uh, being local means making friends. Just have a look at verse 30. And we read that Paul wished to go into the crowd brave chap. Uh, but his disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials of the province of Asia who were friendly to him sent a message to him urging him not to venture into the theatre. Paul has friends who are followers of Jesus. The New Testament calls them disciples. Uh, and he, he's, he's friendly. With that. We go, lovely, we're back on. Let's keep going. So Paul's got some friends who were disciples and followers of Jesus in the local district, but equally he's got some friends, if we look at verse 30 in the following verses, from some officials from the province of Asia. Now, these friends were, as we read into the kind of the culture of the time, these officials were Caesar appointed officials whose chief task was to oversee the worship of the emperor in the province surrounding Ephesus. You might know that Roman law said that Caesar ought to be worshipped as God. There were temples set up to Caesar. You would give money as an offering to Caesar. You would worship Caesar. You would pray to Caesar as if he were God. And these are the officials who were set up to oversee that that was happening. And yet, Paul counts them as his friends, and they are counted as he can, sorry, they count him as one of their friends. In fact, they warn him not to go into the theatre. They really care about him. They don't just care about the locality. They care about him as a person. That suggests a real degree of respect, a real warmth of friendship between them and Paul, and a real background of shared conversation. Clearly, Paul's message that there is only one God is in direct opposition to their message that we ought to be worshipping Caesar as God. And yet, they call Paul a friend. That must have taken real careful handling, but great conversation, real respect, real friendship. Uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that a counsellor who didn't share Marvin Reese's Christian faith was happy to go into his office and to say, can you get your friends in the Christian mafia involved? in this, a real respect, even though there was a faith difference. Marvin, for his part, has done a really a very good job um, about getting the community together. I can remember having pitched up in Bristol in the relatively early stages of being here. He got together basically leaders from charities and businesses and churches and faith groups for breakfast across the city and gathered us all together at the town hall, really with no other purpose than just helping us to get to know each other and to network together to share ideas, to have a conversation, 
and to become friends together. Some of us here will be members of the Sneed Park Residents Association or the Downs Committee. Uh, some of us will be governors and trustees of local educational establishments. Some of us will have really good and interactive relationships with our communities, our neighbourhood watch groups and, and the roads and neighbours around us. Uh, Salvatore loves chatting to me, even as he cuts my almost no hair about church because he's part of our local fabric. Amy's Winehouse loved brewing beer for the Beer and Carols event later on in this uh, term. Uh, being local as a Christian doesn't mean to say that we need to agree with everybody on everything that we talk about. In fact, we'll disagree on plenty of things. Uh, but being local equally doesn't mean being ashamed to hide where we're coming from either. Acceptance works both ways, isn't it? We want to be a community of welcome here as St Mary's Church, but it's not unjustifiable for us to expect a similar kind of welcome when we go out as Christians into other areas of our neighbourhood. Hopefully they'll be welcoming as well. And so we can have a shared, friendly conversation, recognising that we might come from different perspectives, but that it's possible to be friends wherever we're coming from. Uh, and I think actually, as St Mary's, that's something that we, we do relatively well. We are, we're rooted as part of our community and our community see us very much as their parish church. And I hope that's an encouragement to us this morning as we think about the fabric of community that we've got and celebrate that and enjoy that together. So being local partly means just being friends with those around us. Secondly, uh, it means uh, knowing when to speak and knowing when not to speak. Just have a look at verse 32 again. And we read this. In the theatre, uh, some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and most of them didn't know why they had come together. Some of the crowd gave instruction to Alexander, whom the Jews had pushed forward. Alexander motioned for silence and tried to make a defence before the people. But when they recognised that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they shouted together in unison, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Some contexts are good for trying to win friends and influence people. And some contexts, it's better to be quiet in and to be patient. Uh, it strikes me that the church isn't always good at being discerning as to when to speak and when to shut up. Uh, sometimes the church may well have done a better job if we'd listened better first before we spoke. Uh, Many of us will be aware that at the moment the church nationally and locally is engaged in a conversational exercise called Living in Love and Faith about identity, uh, sexuality, gender, relationships. Uh, it strikes me that part of the power of that process is that actually it begins, as we're doing, with a listening exercise. It's a recognition that in this particular area the church has often been quick to speak and has often been slower to listen first. On the flip side, during the pandemic, and particularly during the first lockdown, there was some very justifiable criticism of the church nationally, that actually the church's voice was absent largely from the public sphere, that the church's voice was predominantly how to keep our spaces safe, that was clearly very important, but that we lacked giving the spiritual and emotional well-being voice that our nation at that point so desperately needed, that actually we ought to have been quicker to have spoken, and actually we were silent. Again, I think actually this is an area where we can be quite encouraged as a church at St Mary's. On behalf of the Diocese of Bristol, we are leading the largest living in love and faith conversational exercise shared with our partner churches in the, the mission area. It's really exciting to see Tuesday by Tuesday, so many people having those conversations 
around. Equally, I think that during the lockdown, many people look to us and our church here for that support. They found great um, uh, comfort in what we were able to offer by means of our churchyard, our services online, and we were relatively quick to reopen uh, and to stay open as a place for prayer. But it's a good practical guidance for us to think actually when ought we to listen before we speak and when is it important to speak with the voice of peace that God has given us to speak with. So being local means making friends whether or not we would agree with the people we're making friends with or not to respect and welcome each other. Uh, being, uh, being local also means knowing when to speak and knowing not when to speak. Uh, and finally, being local means celebrating and encouraging secular authority whenever we get the opportunity to do so. Have a look uh, at verse 35, because you've got to say that the city clerk of Ephesus does an awesome job. He stands up in front of a crowd that's about to go on a full scale riot who have just disallowed another person from speaking and have chanted for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. He stands up and verse 35, he quietens down the crowd. I have no idea how he did that, but it's fairly effective even that he did that. And then verse 37, he says this, and it rocks as a statement. You have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess, if therefore Demetrius and the artisans have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring their charges there against one another. If there is anything further you want to know, it must be settled in the regular assembly, for we are in danger of being charged with rioting. In Ephesus, for all its commotion in the theatre, there is the rule of law. There's a functioning system of governance and there's a functioning legal system. Now, those things might not be without their issues. You could pick any number of holes in a whole load of how the Roman Empire ran its affairs. But that's true of pretty much any administration going around the world. Nevertheless, there's plenty that can be celebrated in this context, and there's plenty that can be worked with. Uh, councils must get, imagine, an enormous postbag of complaint. Imagine tomorrow morning for the average councillor or for the average worker as they open up their inbox and the time that people have had over the weekend to send in their email of complaint has led to a groaning inbox of people complaining. And Monday by Monday, that's what lots of our public officials go back to as their week of work of service starts. Uh, one church I know of in uh, Devon, decided to put together a YouTube video which basically had people saying thank you and then something specific that the council had done for that person. Thank you for collecting my bins this week. Thank you for caring for this member of my family. Thank you for educating this person in my family. Thank you for, and they went round and they stitched together this video of thank you and sent it to the council. I wonder how many times councils around the city or around the country get messages like that. There's lots that we can be thankful for in the secular organisation of our city. There's lots that we can give thanks to God for and there's lots that we can thank them directly for. I was speaking uh, over lunch last Sunday to one of our mission partners who lives in a really complicated part of the world. For those of us uh, who uh, were here last Sunday will have heard a little bit about it. Probably if you think about the most complicated bit of the world to live in for local national government administration and being a Christian, that's it. 
Uh, what I was struck by over lunch was her amazing willingness to pragmatically work with the authorities in place, to think what can we get done here? Who are our friends in this context? How can we make things work? Okay, it's not perfect. In fact, it's very far from perfect. In fact, it's a whole load more complicated than Ephesus was for Paul. And yet the questions were still there that we've been looking at this morning. Who are our friends, regardless of whether we agree with them or disagree with them? Who are the people who are friendly to us? When are the times to speak? And when are the times to be quiet? And finally, what can we celebrate in this local administration as being something that we can work with practically and say thank you for. If this particular mission partner can do that in her area of the world, it was a real example to think what we have to be thankful for and how we can be involved locally here in Bristol. Now we were going to um, use a song on YouTube uh, this morning. Um, thank you so much to our tech team at the back who have been uh, coping resiliently with a whole range of technical issues this morning. One of the technical issues is that we're not able to use a YouTube clip that we were about to use now. Uh, we're about to pray for our local community. Uh, and I am therefore going to be the YouTube clip to you, and I am going to sing to you um, without an instrument. So please do bear with my slightly croaky voice this morning. Uh, what I would like you to imagine, it's one of those montage videos that I described to you of kind of people saying thank you. The clip on YouTube has a variety of people in their different workspaces. I wonder where you're going to be tomorrow. Uh, whether you're working or retired, I wonder who you're going to be with, who you're going to be interacting with locally. You might like, uh, as you shut your eyes in just a moment, to imagine yourself into those spaces, but equally to imagine the different people working around our city and to allow these words to resonate with you in your mind's eye. So if it would be helpful to you, do close your eyes uh, and then Caroline, after I've sung to us, is going to pray for us. We seek your kingdom throughout every sphere. We long for heaven's demonstration here. Jesus, your light shine bright for all to see. Transform, revive, and heal society. Before all things, in him all things were made. Inspiring culture, media, and trade. May all our work serve your economy. Transform, revive, and heal society. Peace, truth, and justice reigning everywhere. With us be present in a public square. Fill all who lead with your integrity. Transform, revive, and heal society. Faithful to govern, ever may we be. Selfless in service, 
loving constantly in everything may your authority transform revive and heal society